Hello, and welcome to New Beginnings Baptist Church. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us today for this time of worship. My name is Pastor Brian, and our goal here is to help you to know and love God more. We believe that God has something special planned for you during this time. So let's hear from God's Word now. We are in our study. This is the last week on the series of Waiting on God. And so I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. So far in the series, the whole series kind of focus has been uh, the mistakes that we see in Scripture when, when people of God are waiting on God. Sometimes when we're waiting on God, it is so easy to fall into the traps and the temptations that are around us because we want God to work and we want God to work now. And when God says, just wait, we're, we're not good at waiting. I mean, how many of you get impatient at the drive through Come on, admit it. This is time of confession. It's okay. But yes, if, if Starbucks or McDonald's takes too long, we get, we get a little frustrated and kind of agitated at the fast food. You realize that typically in the rest of the world, it takes half an hour, 45 minutes for your food anyways. So an extra five minutes doesn't, doesn't affect us all that much. But because we want it and we want it now, that causes a problem with us because we don't know what to do when we're waiting. And we've seen in, in our study that what happens when we wait on God, sometimes we try to help God, Abraham and Sarah. And when we try to help God, it's not always very good. As a matter of fact, it's not. There's nothing that we can offer, none of our plans, none of our efforts will, God needs from us. God doesn't need our help. He is more than capable of doing all things. And so what he wants is he wants our attention. He wants our participation in what he's doing. And then we've seen uh, what happens when we grow impatient with God and, and how we react to the situations and to the people around us. We, we've seen Moses... One time it was the people of Israel and they, they were tired of waiting on Moses to bring down the word of God. And so they grew impatient. What they do, they turned to an idol and they worship an idol. And then we saw last week Moses, when he got impatient with God and he, he reacted to the situation, he responded out of anger. He reacted out of anger, both to the people of Israel and to God himself. And so today what I want to do is I want to finish the series by, by not showing you what not to do, because I think I've done that for the last three weeks. I want to show you what we should do when we're waiting on God. And to, to get us in the right mindset, I want to share this story with you that I've heard many times, but I've heard it uh, just recently again. Two farmers were both praying for rain. Rain is very important to farmers, I'm told, because without it, you can't grow crop, you can't have a harvest. So both farmers were desperately in need of rain, must have lived in California. Not this year. One of these stories, they were praying for rain and God answered. But one of them, both of them were desperate. Both of them needed God to bring the rain, but only one of them went and prepared his fields. Which one of those was actually waiting on God to send the rain? So with that, let's turn to our scripture passage. Let me go back and just kind of read something to get us started in uh, 1 Kings 17, verse 1. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Gilead said to Ahab, the king, as the Lord God of Israel lives, in whose presence I stand, there will be no dew or rain during these years except 
by my command. And then we turn in 18, chapter 18, verse 1, it says, A long time, I'll tell you how long in a minute, the word of the Lord appeared to Elijah in the third year, said, Go present yourself to King Ahab again, and I will send rain on the surface of the land. So Elijah went and presented himself to King Ahab. There's a lot that happens. Jump down to verse 41. This is the main text of today. Verse 41, Elijah said to King Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a rainstorm. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the summit of Mount Carmel. He bent down on the ground and put his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look up towards the sea. So the servant went up and looked and said, there's nothing. So seven times Elijah said, go back, go back, go back. But on the seventh time, the servant reported, there is a cloud as small as the man's hand coming up from the sea. Elijah said, go tell Ahab, get your chariot ready and go down so that the rain does not stop you. And in a little while, the sky grew dark with clouds and wind, and there was a downpour. So Ahab got in his chariot, went down to Jezreel, and the power of the Lord was on Elijah, and he tucked his mantle under his belt, and he ran ahead of King Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. May God bless the reading of his word. See, all of this started, going back to chapter 17, this all started with Israel once again doing something that we see them doing time and time again. They turned to an idol. They turned their focus from God and started looking to something they could try to understand, looking to something they could, they could see, because seeing is believing, right, is what most people believe and live by. But it's not. Just because we can't see God doesn't mean that he's not at work. And we as Christians need to remember that as well. Just because we don't see God... In the moment does not mean that God is not working on something. But the people of Israel took their eyes off of God and started worshiping idols once again. Sounds familiar, right? We, I don't need to go and revisit that, that sermon, do I? Do we need to go see what happens when we start worshiping idols? Okay. I, I, I hope and I pray that we've all dealt with the idols in our lives because we all have them. They may not be golden calves or some statue, but we have idols that we struggle with and we put in the place of God. But what happens, this is the different story of when a servant of God actually is waiting on God. See, Israel turned to the idols and that's when Elijah said, there will not be any rain or any dew for, for the Lord has said there shall be none until I say so. And Elijah, during this three and a half years, Elijah is waiting on God. And we see that he is patiently waiting on God. And he is obeying God during all those years. And he's praying and he's waiting and he's thinking and he's waiting and he's praying and he thinks... And then finally God says, go tell the king to get ready now. And so that's exactly what Elijah does. Goes up there and says, all right, king, it's time. Let's go and do this. By the way, I love the actual scene of Elijah on Mount Carmel because he confronts the, the priests and the teachers of the idol worshipers and does a whole nice showdown. And it's amazing to see what God does here and I could, I could talk a lot about what happens on Mount Carmel, but what I'm trying to focus our attention on today is what Elijah is doing. What Elijah does here, he only does one thing throughout this entire story so far. 
he prays. That's the first thing that I want us to realize. That's the only thing, really. If you hear nothing else of today's sermon, this is it. When we are waiting on God, the one thing that we are supposed to do is pray. Not just once, not just on Sundays, we are to pray. We are waiting on God to do a work. Pray. We are waiting on God to provide a miracle. We need to pray. We are waiting on God. We need to pray. Elijah prays. I love his prayers. In verse 37 is the summary of his prayer. We didn't read it, but here I'll read it back to you now. Elijah is praying on Mount Carmel in front of this whole situation, this whole scene with the idol worshipers and the priests there. And all he does is he prays, answer me, Lord, answer me so that the people will know that you are God. Man, that's a short prayer. That is a powerful prayer. That should be our prayer as we are waiting on God. God, with our church, we are praying for some things. Answer us so that Rathrum and the people around us can know that you are God. In our families, we need you, God. We have some things going on. So we are praying, God, we pray that you answer us so that our families will know that you are God. God. And I love the rest of it there in verse 37. So that you turn their hearts back. So that you turn their hearts back. See, prayer is the primary work of Christians. We don't act like it. We don't really do this much. But prayer is the primary work that we're supposed to be about. Yes, evangelism is important. Yes, discipleship is important. Yes, Sunday school. And yes, all the things that we do, worship, fellowship, all that is important. But the primary work, the most important work that we as believers can do is pray. Elijah prays. And when he is praying, that's when God starts to work both in Elijah's life and in the nation's situation. See, prayer is our direct connection to God. That is the way that we hear from God and God reveals himself to us. We need to pray so that we get to see the presence of God. Moses was on the Mount Sinai when he was in prayer when the presence of God descended. Oh, he didn't get to see the face of God because the scripture says no one in our sinful fallen condition can look upon the true holiness of God. That's why even in Revelation when John was there getting a glimpse of heaven and he looks to the throne and what does he see? He sees that angels are covering the presence of God because John could not stand it. John would die in the presence of God because of his fallen condition. But when we get to see the presence of God, we can't see the face of God, but when we get to see the presence of God, it changes everything. And prayer is where that happens. Church, prayer is where we get the direct connection to the presence of God. Prayer is where we get to see his power on display. Oh, I love this. The power of prayer is great and the power of prayer works. But not only is this where people get to see the presence and the power of God, but it's when we get a direct connection to the plan of God. If we do not pray, God will not answer. Jesus teaches that in Matthew. 
James says it this way. James chapter 4 says, you do not have because you do not ask. Or you ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. So let's take a step back here. James is challenging us. He's saying, what is going on? We need to understand the power and the presence and all that things. We need to understand the, the, the significance of prayer. So James is saying, pray with the right motives and pray with confidence and pray. That's, that's what we need to do is we need to pray. When we are waiting on God, when we need an answer from God, the thing that we're supposed to do is pray. Do you get this? Let me explain here. Prayer is not bargaining with God. It's not let's make a deal with God, okay? That's not what prayer is. Prayer is also not demanding. God, I want you to do this, this, and this. Prayer is not those things. It's also not only just asking for things. So many people, prayer is, is like sitting on Santa Claus' lap. Here's what I want for Christmas. God, I want you to do this, this, and this in my life. That's not prayer. Prayer is not trying to control God, and it's not trying to, to manipulate God. It's also, this is important too, it's also not a sign of your spiritual maturity because whether you're brand new in the faith or whether you've been a Christian for a long time, prayer is and prayer can be the same. Prayer is, though, looking to God as the omnipotent, powerful, sovereign God that he is. Prayer is coming to him and saying, God, you are in control. I am not. So if it is your will, please do this. Nonetheless, just like Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is looking to the sovereign God and realizing he's the one in control. God is all powerful. We are not. God sees all things. We don't see even a small picture of it. Prayer is also worshiping God as a holy God. So with that in mind, let's talk about some components of prayers that we see here in the, in the scripture, especially in our text. I love verse 41. It said, when Elijah says to King Ahab, he says, now go up up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a rainstorm. Now, again, when we just read over that, it's kind of like, okay, there's the sound of a rainstorm. You guys all have heard rainstorms before, don't you? I mean, I love the sound of rain and thunder and, and all that. It's kind of calming to me now. If you know my story, it wasn't always the case, but now it is. But the power of prayer is our faith. And we see that here in this verse. The power of prayer is seen right here in this verse. Go up and eat and drink for there is the sound of a rainstorm. Let's take a look at the overall picture here. It has not rained in Israel for three and a half years. There's not been a cloud in the sky. There's not been rain or dew or even the slightest hint of it for such a long time. I know we are looking at it three and a half years doesn't seem like that long, does it really? When you're in the midst of all that, three and a half years can feel like an eternity. Three and a half years can feel like a long time for someone who's agriculturally based society that's needing that rain. And to go with no rain and no dew for that long, see, they're not used to it anymore. To see 
clouds in the sky or to, to see rain or to feel moisture. I can imagine what the humidity reports were on, on Israel during this time. I wish they were keeping track to see it at 0%. Talk about a dry heat. So when they haven't seen rain, they haven't seen clouds in this long, and we see from the rest of the text, the servant goes up and says, there's nothing in the sky. It's completely blue, clear sky. Elijah, I don't know what you're talking about. The sound of rain. There's not even, this, there's not even a, a sign of rain yet. But see, the power of prayer is faith. And faith is comes by hearing the word of God, Romans tells us. Faith comes when we believe God at his word and God says, now's the time for rain. And even though the sky is clear, even though the wind has not picked up, even though there's no evidence of it, Elijah is speaking with confidence. He says, the sound of a rainstorm is coming. I hear the rain. See, people of faith like Elijah, often sound crazy. Elijah, I don't know what you're talking about. Man, it is blue skies and it is calm weather out there. We haven't seen rain in years. What do you mean the sound of a rainstorm? People of faith often sound crazy, especially when we start talking about prayer specifically. But it's our proximity to God. It's our closeness to God. And like we said, prayer is our direct access to the God, creator, sovereign, Lord over all the universe. And when we are close to him, we can hear things. We can see things. We can know things before the rest of the world ever does. Jesus said this way, that God reveals his plans to his children because you are no longer a servant that is only held to little glimpses of what the master is doing. But now as children of God, Jesus says, we can know the plans of God. So Elijah knows what God's getting ready to do because he's close to God. That's the power of prayer is it enhances and grows our faith. And it's during the times of waiting when we will hear God working before we ever see God working. When we see When we hear that God, the the movement of God is starting to churn the wheels and starting to get things in place, we may not see the evidence of God yet physically or, or how we expect it, but we know it's coming. That's the power of prayer because it enhances and grows our faith. But I want you to see something else here. Verse 42 says, Ahab went to go eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the summit of Mount Carmel and he bent down on the ground and put his hands and his face between his knees. I would get down in the position, but I'm afraid I wouldn't get back up right now. As a matter of fact, as a little exercise, let's just have all of you getting down into this. No? Okay. But that's what I want to talk to you about is the position of prayer. See, this position is a position of submission. In in ancient times, in medieval times, when you approached the king, you got down on the ground on your knees and you bowed your head. Why? Because you were submitting your entire life to the authority of that king. And Elijah is here on the ground, hand, on his knees, hands down. Now, there's a couple of different things here. It might be just that he is actually on his knees and, he's, and his face is to the ground, like we see in most pictures of prayer, probably some that you have actually been in before. But then there's also the one where they may be still just kind of squatting in a bent position and their head is actually down between their knees, 
this is a position of labor. This is a position in the Old Testament, in ancient days, they didn't have midwives and they didn't have hospitals and nice birthing rooms and all this. This was the natural position for birthing a child. It was a position of labor. A position of great, well, if you've ever been around, the birth of a child is a great miracle. But how much control does a woman have over everything when she's in the middle of labor? None. She has like no control over anything. How much control do husbands have during labor? Absolutely none. <laughs> this is a position of submission, but it's also a position of labor. There's no requirement to kneel when we pray, but there is a reason why Elijah bends down in this position. Not only is he submitting to God, saying, God, you are the sovereign king, and I place my entire life. You can choose to kill me now, or you can choose to raise me up. The, the, it's all yours. You get to decide. That's the medieval thought process. Or maybe go back even further. This is the position where God, this is work. Prayer is work. If you think about it, that, that prayer is just like birthing a child. I know it, don't go too far with this illustration, but I want you to see some similarities. It is work. Prayer sometimes can be uncomfortable. If, you, if you've ever been around a, a woman in labor, it is not comfortable. She's not sitting there thinking, Oh, yeah, let's go get a smoothie. No. I, you know what? I'm just going to sit here in the recliner for a little bit longer because, you know, it's just so comfortable. No. When you're in the middle of labor, it's time to go, and it's time to go now. It's uncomfortable. It's also exhausting. Women get, get wore out. Like... Trying to walk in and, and visit with a brand new mother right after they gave in birth. Yeah, they're not, they're exhausted for the next 18 years at least from that moment of birthing that child. <laughs> but it's exhausting, it's uncomfortable, just like prayer can be. Prayer can be exhausting. When we're praying and praying and needing God to work, we need to pray more. And we, we don't see God yet working yet. We need to pray more. It seems like it's exhausting and it's work. It's hard work. It's labor. It's uncomfortable because the scripture even says there's times when we're praying that we don't even know what to pray for. But yet the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, can take our rambling on in our prayers, our muttering, and change it to exactly what we need to say in our prayers. Prayer can be uncomfortable, it can be exhausting, it can be painful and seem futile. But yet it is without prayer and without the work of prayer and the position of prayer in our life, we will never see the work of God done in our presence. That scares me, honestly. Not only as a pastor, but as a Christian. It, if I never see God's work in my life, that honestly scares me because the Bible says God is constantly at work around us. That God every day is saying, you know what, I'm going to do something new. God is the God of creation, and he didn't stop on day six. God is still creating today. And if I, as a, a, a quote-unquote believer in God, never see the work of God done in my life, never see the miracles of God done in my everyday life, that scares me. So that's where I get into the position of prayer and I say, God, I'm submitting my life to you. I need you to, God, I can't even make it through a single 
day or an hour or even a minute without your work in my life. God, I'm submitting all of my life to you. And we see that here when Elijah bends down, gets down in that position where he kneels before God and he is laboring for this moment and he's praying, God, answer me so that the people may know that you are God and that you will turn their hearts back to, to yourself. God, that's what we need you to do. That's the work that we need to be a part of. We need to see the power of prayer that grows our faith. We need to be in the position of prayer where we submit to him, but also we need to understand the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer here is actually found in verse 36. I know, it, it'd be better if I was doing this in order, right? Well, just follow me here. Verse 36 Elijah offers up his prayer and says, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that at your word I have done these things. Notice in this prayer, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that you are God, that I am your servant, at your word, I have done these things. Is Elijah's prayer focused on him or on God? Is Elijah asking for recognition and saying, listen, prove that I am your servant. Prove to everyone else that I am not a fake, not a fraud, not a fool. I am not just making this stuff up. I, you know, that you are God so that I don't look so bad. Is that what Elijah's praying here? If you listen to the tone and listen to the words of this prayer, God, I don't, uh, I can look like a fool for you. I don't care. I can look like an idiot. And I don't really care about my reputation. God, I want you to answer my prayers so that you are seen as the one true God, that your words are completed because I truly believe that you have given me these words. I know your voice and you have told me to do these things. I don't want it to prove that I am right here in front of all these people. I want it so that they know that you are God. It's not about me. It's about you, God. So the, the purpose of prayer is about glorifying, honoring God. You know, I loved our songs today. We heard this same word in several of the songs, hallelujah. That's a churchy word, isn't it? Hallelujah. Have you ever looked up what hallelujah actually means? It's a call to all of us who are hearing the word to praise Yahweh. It's a, it's, Two Hebrew words mixed together to, to create the new word, hallelujah. It's a call to praise, holla. Not like modern songs, you know, holla back. It's actually a Hebrew word. But then Yahweh is that last part, hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. Praise God. And that's exactly what Elijah is praying. He's, he's realized the purpose of prayer is to glorify God. Prayer comes from a relationship with God and only genuine prayer seeks to glorify God and glorify Him only. So Elijah prayed this so that the people would know the one true God. And Elijah believed because God had already saved his life numerous times. He already knows the power of God. Elijah doesn't need God to answer his prayers for him. God, I already believe in you. I already submit to you. God, I already know your power. God, my faith is already enhanced. I don't, I'm not praying for myself. Now, some of us need to pray and experience the true power of prayer so that we do grow in those areas. 
But looking around, most of you already know this stuff. This is, this is nothing new. I know you're looking at me like, Pastor, we've heard this all before. But we need to do it for others to see the glory of God. Elijah was a per- prophet and the servant of Israel, but his loyalty was to God and God alone. Two quick things here to, as we kind of wrap this up, and we want to talk about this. I could already hear some of the objections, but, but pastor, what happens when we don't see the answer of God? When we don't feel like God is really hearing our prayers? What about those times? Elijah got to see the answer to his prayers right away, and it was dramatic, and it was, it was real. But what are we supposed to do? Well, actually, it's in this text again. Verse 43, so he went up and and he said to his servant, go look towards the sea. And he went up and there's nothing. He did this seven times. So what are, uh, God's not answering his prayers. Elijah's up on the mountain and he's praying and he's praying. He's like, all right, servant, go look and go, go see, you know, go, go figure it out. Go, go see if God's ready to do his work here. And and there's nothing. I don't know what you're doing. It's kind of like when God told Israel to march around the walls of Jericho and all you're, do, all you're supposed to do is go out there and praise him for, for six days in a row. It feels like there's nothing going on. God's not answering our prayers. And see, as Christians, we often are praying for things in our lives and in our family and in our church and in our community. We're praying and we're praying and we're just not seeing God answer our prayers, so we give up. Can you imagine if on the fifth or sixth time, Elijah said, well, I guess I got it wrong. Today is not going to rain. It's probably going to rain tomorrow. He would have been a modern day meteorologist, I'm telling you. Well, there's a 50% chance of rain, and there's a 50% chance of sun. And well, there might be clouds. It might be hot. It might be cold. I don't know. What happens when we don't hear the answer of God? We don't see God answering our prayers? Keep praying. Keep at it. Don't give up. Six times Elijah prayed and the servant looked and there was nothing. But on the seventh time. On the seventh time when Elijah was praying, on the seventh time when Israel walked around the walls, on the seventh time, that's when God answered those prayers. Seven in Scripture is often the time of completion. So when we don't see the answer to our prayers, keep praying. Now there's one other objection I can almost hear everyone saying right away, pastor, that's good. And and this is inspiring. This is, this is motivational, but pastor, I'm not like Elijah. Pastor, Elijah was a prophet of God. He was a servant of God. I'm not like Elijah. I, I can't pray and control the rain or the weather. Now, interesting you bring that up. James chapter 5 says this specifically, verse 17 and 18. Now, Elijah was a human being just like we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced fruit once again. I've heard this said. Well, I'm not like Elijah. God doesn't answer my prayers like he does Elijah's. And to me personally, it it became a real motivation when I was reading through this, and, and I came across verse 17 and 18 there in James. And, and I said, wait a second here. So God, you're saying that, that my prayers 
could control the weather as long as I understand the purpose and the power of prayer and I submit to your will and I, I'm doing those things. So you're saying that I could pray and possibly control the weather. Now, it's only happened a few times, but it has happened to where my prayers did affect the weather. I'll give you the short stories if you want to hear the longer stories. So for the longest time, I was in charge of the youth camps around here. And specifically, we had a winter camp that was like the camp. And it was usually around this time. But for several years, when we first started, when I was first in charge, we didn't have snow. We didn't have we didn't have a lot. It was all mud and rain. That's all it was for a long time. For a couple of years, it was mud and rain. You know how fun it is to have winter camp with mud and rain? Not fun at all. Kids try to go sledding down the hill, and it's not <laughs> fun trying to, to slide in that mud. So I decided that's about the time God was working on mine. He says, why don't you pray, Brian? Pray so that the weather doesn't become a distraction from what I'm doing. And that's all I was doing. I was praying, God, would you please let it snow so that the kids could focus on you at winter camp and not be complaining and not... Kind of, the, the youth at the time were a lot like Israel. They were just constantly complaining to me and so... What I did was I started praying. I didn't tell anybody this, but I started praying. That winter camp that, that I started praying, you know what we did? We almost got snowed in on that weekend. We had, we had so much snow that it wasn't, we got to the camp, it started just dumping tons of snow over a weekend, and we almost couldn't get out of there. And then I was like, okay, that's a coincidence, right? So I started praying again the next year. Finally, someone got wind of this by about the third, fourth year. They said, Brian, would you stop? Stop praying. I was like, why? Because we, we don't want to drive in this when we go to the winter camp. I was like, but it's working because we're seeing kids get saved every year. We're seeing more kids get discipled every year at winter camp. The other way that I've seen it that, well, why can't our prayers work the same way Elijah prayers do? work. What if we were to start praying for God to work in our, in our church? What if we were to pray like Elijah in our own lives? What if we were to start praying like Elijah in our community? And what I'd do is I'd go up to somebody and I'd say, would you please pray about this? I had about five people tell me, Brian, I don't ever want you to come and tell me to pray about anything again. I was like, that's kind of rude. I thought that's what we're supposed to be doing as church members as Christians, is praying for each other and with each other. I thought that's exactly what we're supposed to do. They said, it's not that you're asking me to pray. It's that when you, when you ask me to pray, you've already heard from God, and I don't like it. You already know the answer. I was like, no, I don't. But it sure seemed like they, they felt I did because my asking of them to pray was something that God was already doing in their life. Now again, this is not about me. Because I could give you numerous other stories where, where my prayers were ineffective. Because I was praying with the wrong motives. I was praying for the wrong things. I wasn't as close to God in those moments. I could tell you all those times, but what I do want you to see is that prayer works. And prayer is our primary job as believers. James says Elijah was human just like us. And he had powerful prayers. Why can't we pray the same way? When, we're, when we don't see God at work, why can't we hear the thunderstorms just like Elijah did? Why can't we see the rain come? Why can't we have the faith that when we see the cloud the size of a human hand, that's small, and, he's, and within the, the hour, it becomes 
pitch black because the storm clouds covered the land. Why can't we pray like that? Why can't we see God work in our community, our church, our life, our family that way? There is nothing stopping us from having powerful, effective prayers. That's what I love about James chapter 5. It says the prayers of the righteous, I love the redneck version, the prayers of the righteous get the whole lot done. Why can't our prayers be effective? Revelation 3 says, God opens doors that no one closes. And God has placed before us an open door to see the blessings of heaven poured out. All we got to do is ask. Prayer. When we're waiting on God, when we need an answer from God, pray. Pray.